Hi, and welcome to Trauma Solve. This week, I had the pleasure of interviewing energy healer, Greg Chapman. Greg has been working with the ancient didgeridoo for years, helping people to heal from all sorts of mind, body, and spirit problems by helping them to enter a meditative state and allowing their mind and body to connect and healing to occur. If you're on your healing journey from trauma, you will be experiencing some levels of disconnection from yourself because this is what happens as a result of trauma. You may be disconnected from your emotional self, for instance. If that's the case, you probably you might be experiencing numbness, uh, where you don't really connect with your emotions very well, or you might be experiencing overwhelm where your emotions come up and you really struggle with knowing how to handle them. If that's the case for you, meditation can be so incredibly helpful in not only helping you to reconnect to your emotions, but also in helping you to learn how to process them and release any negative energy that you're carrying. So if that's the case for you and you're struggling with a connection to your emotional self, I hope you find this interview helpful and enlightening. And next week, Greg has offered to do a healing session on the channel. So I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to doing that. And I hope you get something really helpful from this interview. Um, so Greg, could you introduce yourself and describe a little bit about what you do with your didgeridoos that are all lined up behind you, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, so my name's Greg and Greg Chapman, and uh, I play the uh, Australian didgeridoo. And I, uh, I'm originally, I am from Australia, and so I, I picked up my first didge when I went back to Australia in, in 2007. And uh, I had a lesson with an Aboriginal uh, elder, and um, I, uh, I just started teaching myself. And then uh, uh, what happened about two years later, it, it took me to learn how to play. And so um, I, uh, I, I found that I would go into an altered state of, uh, of, of deep relaxation while I was playing. And I just sort of lost track of who I am and my physical body and just this amazing feeling of, 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 of peace, really, really beautiful. And so I, that's what I noticed for myself. And then it was one day I was, I was playing at a backyard barbecue and uh, a friend who'd been in a car accident said to me, uh, would you mind um, playing your didgeridoo on her shoulder? <laughs> I said, okay, right yeah. where she was having pain. So anyway, I did that and then about a week or so later, she uh, sends me an email and uh, in the email she says, I don't know what you've done, but the pain's gone. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. That's really, really interesting. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how this works, but it's doing something. <laughs> and so from then I was, I was hooked. And then I thought, well, because uh, I already had evidence of what it was doing for me when I played, now I have physical evidence for somebody else. So I thought, right, well, I'll do some meditation classes. And so, um, and then it just grew. It grew really, really quickly. And um, I started getting into special needs schools, uh, autism especially, um, mental health units, hospitals, disability groups and charities. Uh, yeah, mental health units, hospitals, that sort of a thing um, in the UK. And so that's really, really how I got into it. Mm. So, so initially it was a physical um, yeah. problem that you healed. I healed, yeah. Sort of like with, almost like with ultrasound, it kind of reminds me of ultrasound. Yeah, well it works very much the similar way that ultrasound works, so um, right. yeah. Same, same sort of concept, but this is this is low frequency range, and uh, so yeah, when, when you play it close to you know, our fascia or um, you know, um, our joints, if we may be experiencing arthritis, it works in the same way to help ease it out. 
So that, that's really interesting. So it's not just a, so initially the first thing was a physical healing physical. that happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you started working in other areas. So, so it's, it's a bit of a mind, body, spirit healing whole, instrument. The whole thing, yeah. Yeah, it works on all levels. Uh, mentally, uh, it's called brain wave entrainment. And uh, this, is a, this is a scientific concept whereby we can't help but to step into synchronization with the dominant frequency around us. Right, okay. okay. So for example, if, if, if you're in a stressful environment, that stressful environment has, is, has a frequency to it because everything mm -hmm. is in it. So unless you're like a Buddha, you know, and you meditate daily, well, then you'll, you'll pick up on the stress because we are part of our environment. Uh, and we see all this, this also with, I, I didn't know this until I, until I asked my late wife. I said, because um, I found out that the, the women who work together, often their cycles step into synchronization. And, and I said, you what? Really? <laughs> No idea about this is it no sure she said yes it's true she said all my she works with all women she says we often we often all um <laughs> happen around the same time of the month i thought well, this is interesting it, it sort of says well whatever is the dominant frequency that everybody else steps in tune with it it's the same thing with working you know uh, um, uh, musically um uh, it, it's difficult to play out of tune. You sort of feel as though you, you, you get pulled in to the rhythm. And drummers, for example, will naturally find a rhythm that they will step into, that they'll lock into. So nature tends to find the way of least resistance. It likes to be attracted to like energy. Yeah, like, absolutely. For example. Uh, and so, um, so therefore, this is producing a, a, a low frequency range, and uh, apparently, some of that frequency range is down in alpha, which, of course, is alpha frequency range. So, therefore, it, it slows down your brainwave function to a state of deep relaxation. Okay. And this is why it's just so effective at, at helping people to first of all just to relax and then once we once we start to 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 slow down the mind from from those higher frequency ranges you know the the uh what's um a beta range which was more stressful sort of a range we want to slow people down and so the, the, and this is where the, um, the, the, the rest mode steps in. The parasympathetic can step, can step in. And this is right. where we're more able to feel when we are in a state of relaxation. When we're in a state of stress, we can't heal because we're running away from something. You know, we're running away from the saber-toothed tiger that doesn't even exist. You know, we haven't changed really as much. From caveman times, you know, we live in modern day lives, but yet we're still running away from things, you know, and there really is no need. So this is why it is so important that we can learn to um, recognize when we are stressed, when we are having these emotions, and we can have various techniques at our disposal to help slow us down so that we can think clearer more slower and you know engage in self engage in self healing um so, so, yeah, so that's on the spiritual so that's on the mental level um, on the physical level yeah like we just explained it works the same way that ultrasound works and i've had lots of really good results with that with people from you know things like sciatica and fibromyalgia and arthritis so i once did a session with 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 a um uh, what were they they were an alzheimer's group that's right uh, a, a group of elderly people and uh and this guy he, um he, he rocked up with his zimmer frame and he was all stooped over like this and uh, so he came and sat down in the front 
and uh, I didn't wasn't really playing particularly close to him at all. Um, but afterwards, he he got up, and it, he he walked out without his Zimmer frame, and he was upright. So they had to remind him that he'd forgotten his Zimmer frame. <laughs> <laughs> Although he walked, uh, he walked out upright, <laughs> not stooped over like this. He so, just sounded like one of those Bible hearing stories, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> like and I just go, whoa, this is really interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I've had all sorts of really interesting results with people with physical things going on. Yeah, and, and people with head injuries as well. And I'll often feel the vibration where they've had the head injury. Right. Uh, Apparently, I've, I've found out that it's safe uh, for people who have metal implants, whereas normal ultrasound, it works at a much higher frequency range, is, is not good for people that have metal implants. But this is, this is safe to use. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And uh, with pregnancy... Can I just ask you, Greg, sorry, can I just ask you, um, you've got obviously um, a range of didgeridoos behind you and you're, you know, you're talking about a lot of different um, problems that, that, that you've used, used them successfully for. It, are the different didgeridoos, um, do they give a different frequency? Does, it, does each instrument offer a different frequency which has a specific use or? That's why I can't have just one. Right. <laughs> to have a whole family. Uh, yes, uh, each didgeridoo will, uh, will have its own uh, uh, frequency, its own loudness, its own natural sort of a timbre, if you like. Um, uh, generally, the science is the shorter the didgeridoo, the less volume, the higher the frequency. Okay. The longer the ditch, the more volume in the ditch generally will be the lower the frequency. However, it's not always a hard and fast rule. Um, I have one ditch here that is one of my favourites. Um, uh, this is quite a short didgeridoo by all means. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually quite a low frequency. It resonates around about B flat A sharp, which is quite low. I've got another ditch behind me here that is about the same length. And it's a D, and that's about what a B D. That's about a fifth away uh, if you're into music. Um, so there is sort of a science there, but it's not always a clear cut. So uh, I've got another ditch here that that resonates at about the same frequency as this, but it's about another. It's about nearly another foot longer. Right. So do you use your intuition? Are you using your intuition to know which one to? To use for a particular person or situation? Yeah, intuition plays a part, but generally I'll, I'll pick uh, for things like physical things. I will generally play a, a, a higher frequency ditch like a D, uh, E, um, a higher frequency ditch, more powerful, and uh, I, I have a I don't have it on. No, I don't have it with me. I have a stand that I can put it on, and it means that I can direct it to where it needs. So I can put people in a chair, and if they've got in, you know, back whatever back back pain, I can direct it to where it's needed. So okay. yeah. Okay. I I am. Um, I recently purchased your um, Serenity uh, meditation um, download. And something I noticed from listening to that, and I've been meditating for a few years now, so about eight years, something like that. Yes. And um, so I've tried all, you know, I've tried out lots of different different types of meditating, from just being quiet to various, you know, different uh, guided meditations and so on. What I found with your uh, listening to the didgeridoo, and it was the first time that I've ever done that, so it was a bit of an experiment, I suppose. And and what I found really surprising about it was that it was it connected me to my emotions my deep emotional self very very quickly um and effectively and that happened the first time and i've used it several times since now since i bought it and every single time i find that it very quickly gets me out of my head and connects me to my deeper emotional self which was really interesting to me um, as a therapist yeah. um, because 
and especially around trauma because trauma often disconnects a person from their deeper emotions yes. it's something that happens you know as a natural protective uh, mechanism for people when they're experiencing trauma and often you know for, for some significant time afterwards um, yes. so so I found that really interesting um, could you could you speak a little bit more to that yeah you're you're you're, you're right uh, it, it really because it has this effect on our brain waves it slows us down so it slows down the stress response so it, it's therefore it's beneficial for just about all sorts of emotions um, I, uh, I my, my wife passed away last July and uh, we're coming up to we're coming up to 12 months and so I've found that the the ditch has been just so uh, so vital really for me to to just be able to um, to when I play it's kind of like I'm I'm, I'm, allow, I'm I'm sending all that grief all that emotion out through the ditch and um, I just find that, that that when I play it 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 just makes me feel so peaceful and it just reminds me again uh, as to who I am, that I'm more than this physical body. Uh, it also, in a way, connects me up to my to my wife because you know she's now energy. <laughs> she's passed on, um, and so yeah, I, I I very much feel a connection with her. Uh, it slows me down um, mentally. Um, it it alters my breathing rate, so it's playing it is so good for your breathing uh, I basically do the kundalini breath when I when I play uh, so it's really good for slowing down that um, but yes yeah, so, but when I play like your sorry my uh, my, my recent download I, I, I play that nearly every night and uh, I, I never I very rarely reach the end of it <laughs> Because it just sends me <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. I go off very quickly, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need much of an excuse to uh, drop into a state of relaxation. You know, I'm sort of there most of the time anyway. Um, but, yeah, it, for, for me it really works. I'm having some great feedback, so including from you. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, actually. I mean, I... Um... I can totally vouch for it not taking very long to get you into <laughs> into a, a really good a meditative state. Um, I actually um, listened to it again because I knew I was going to be speaking to you today. I found myself off with the fairies, not able to uh, <laughs> focus on on what you were saying on it because you actually introduced the didgeridoo on it, and um, yeah. you know yeah. it, it really is a powerful tool. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you if you could sort of tell a bit more about where it came from. Obviously, it's like an Aboriginal instrument, isn't yeah. it? Can yeah. A little bit more about that. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, it, it it comes from the uh, uh, original custodians of Australia, the uh, the Aboriginal people. This is their this is their spiritual instrument. Um, they call it the Yadaki. Uh, it's been given the name didgeridoo by uh, by a white fella, and um, basically it's believed to be the oldest one of the oldest woodwind instruments in the world that goes back to around two thousand years. Oh. It's been carbon dated in in caves where there's where where they depicted paintings of excuse me uh, spirits playing the didgeridoo, so they've they've been able to carbon date it to around two thousand years. So basically, it's a uh, it, it's a tree trunk or a branch from off of a a tree, uh, a type of eucalyptus tree. Oh, really? Spiritual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, it's all done by termites. Termites. Um, just you know, imagine it used to be a a tree growing in the ground, and so termites would make themselves a nest inside. And uh, they just eat their way through the tree trunk, leaving it hollow. And they don't like sunlight, and so that's why you, you, they they only eat through the insides. 
Yeah. So, um, and then you've got a, and then you got a didgeridoo. So it's actually so, created. It's created by nature. By nature. That's yeah. really yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Then the uh, Aboriginal will then come along and he'll find that one that's hollowed out. You know, it'll sound a bit hollow when he taps on it. Yeah. Knock it down, get the bark off of it, uh, paint it up, uh, and then um, they have beeswax, beeswax on the end, and uh, that just softens it so you get a nice mouthpiece. And so each one is is uh, totally unique, and they're all pieces of they're all pieces of art. Um, this one has the um, has the has the serpent on it, which is their story of of creation. And um, so there's there's it's all it all links up to their dream time um, stories. Um, you know, this one has the so. The, all the paint comes from um, from the earth as well. It's as this is called red ochre, which is the colour you get from from the desert. You know the sand. Right. If you, look, if you look at Uluru, also you know you might know it as Ayers Rock. It's, it's called Uluru. It's yeah. that colour. It's that colour red. So this is the predominant colour of the sand of of you know, out, out in the desert. So they mix that up to form a paint. And paint it on. So all the colours come from off the land, different types of chalks and ochres and types of rocks that they grind up into stones. And so each one tells a story. So this is the uh, this is the barramundi, which is a, a really big fish that grows up in the Northern Territory. And so you know it's about us being in harmony with our with nature. And and this one is uh, got. There's Ula, there's Ularu there, right. and that's the Olgas. And you got kangaroos jumping over on the back there, out in the desert. Um, so yeah, they all they all tell some sort of a story. Uh, there's there's a lot of story in this one. Oh, glad that didn't land on my head. That could have been. That could have been session over. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of story in this in this one. Uh, yeah. Can you? Can you yeah. Uh, so these are the, these are, are Aboriginal people, and these are their these are their spears, and so this is like a it's like a community, okay, and they're sitting around. This is often where you see circles uh, often means uh, a, a campsite, a gathering, can mean a, a, a billabong, which is a, a, a water hole. Yeah. Um, so you've got um, meetings over here, men. Uh, you've got uh, the different aspects of aspects of nature. You've got the different different tribes this represents different different skin colors yeah that's cool that's really cool uh, yeah they all have a they all have a a meaning so i'll put him over i won't dare to put him back so it's it, it's really interesting it's really interesting to me um the whole um concept of aboriginal dream time and the fact that they um that that instrument is their kind of passage it sounds like that's their passage into dream time in waking yeah. time yeah. um and it's just interesting isn't it because um native tribes all have their way of finding that place yeah they all have you know different tribes from and different you know um, indigenous people from all over the world have their own way and some of them do it through um you know, um psychoactive drugs or you know mushrooms for example or ayahuasca or or whatever um drumming dancing so um but we, i know with the aboriginal aboriginal tribe they they credit dream time as being as relevant as waking time don't they and in yeah. fact i think even more am i am i right yeah. am i right about that it's very important to them it's you know every everything has uh that uh, has has what they call a song line 
uh, all different parts of nature, they all have their own song line. And so these song lines then form part of the dream time. Um, I, I find it fascinating. I, I'm, I'm learning, learning lots and lots about it. Uh, I, I could certainly never profess to be an expert at it. Um, yeah, but it, it really is. It's, it's quite a beautiful, beautiful sense of this interconnectedness and, and this oneness with, with all life and with all animals and the earth, the, the stars, the sky, the sun, the moon, the water. Everything is all part of the same thing and so are we. And it's, it's really quite beautiful. It's, it's just so interesting, isn't it? I think as well, and so needed because um, in the Western world, we sort of uh, have such a, I don't know if it's correct to say left brain focus, but it, mm. sort of we have this focus on the material world, which we're um, educated into at school uh, and yeah. so on. And, and not really the same, the same credit isn't given or credibility actually to, um, to energy and connection and the unseen world. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you, you're sort of reminding me of, um, I don't know if you ever saw, um, you probably heard of Jill Balty Taylor who had a stroke and uh, she was a neuro, um, she was a brain surgeon basically. Yeah, I remember, yes, yes, very interesting. Yes. Yeah, fascinating. So she she had a stroke and was and was unable to to utilize the part of her brain that you know recognizes or her left brain, I guess, that recognizes people and names and so on. She was all in the 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 other side of her brain, which was energy mm -hmm. and interconnectedness, and it completely changed her life and uh, and her perspective on life and. Uh, so, so I think that um, things like you know the didgeridoo and what you're doing is so important to bring that balance back um, yes. for people. Yes, I agree. It connects us up with who we are. You know, it, I I have so many people after uh, I've been doing online sessions as well, and I've got people from all around the world joining, and 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 quite quite often. Uh, people will say to me like wow you know i've i've had some clarity on, on something or you know um i've i've just you know i've i've just decided to pick up a creative project again or during while i was listening um you know i could uh, i had one lady a year or so back she she'd done she'd been making like rag rugs and like not just little things like massive great big things but she had she come to a complete standstill on it she said to me during the session she could see it in the mind clearly what it was going to look like and then she could finish it and i thought well, that's really really interesting and certainly with my work in in schools uh, what i would find is is that without any input from me um, uh, after I've done a session with, with the kids, um, you know, a 20, 30 minute session, uh, what they would do, these, these were special needs kids, high functioning special needs. They would, they would get together and, and they'd start talking about what they had seen in their imagination during the session. And, wow. and this was like the, the English teacher came up to me and said, you know, I, I can't get the kids to do this at all. Get them to use their imagination whatsoever. He said, this is a, it's a battle for me to get kids to do creative writing. He said, you've just, you've just inspired them to do that. And what they then did is there is an English lesson. They started writing about what they had imagined. That's so amazing. They're getting the imagination, they're getting the English they're getting writing skills, they're getting communication because yeah. these they have limited communication. They're high, they're high functioning autism, Asperger's, ADHD sort of, sort of kids, you know, those, those that don't quite fit into the normal schools, mainstream schools, so to speak. So things like that that I, that I just have regularly, um, people just say, you know, wow, it's like I've just had clarity on something on an area of my life. 
I think it's because, you know, when we slow down that monkey mind, that yeah. stress, you know, if we slow that down, then the imagination has got a chance, you know, Absolutely. start to process things in it without the stress. So you, you're basically get, getting people into flow state. That, that's what you're yeah. doing, isn't it? You're getting yeah. them into flow state. Yeah. When you say about, we talk about processing things, you know, processing uh, without the stress. So that, um, so I'm thinking now about emotions, go, going back to um, connectivity and being able to process difficult emotions. Yeah. I noticed that um, on, on on your website, that um, on your homepage, um, I will leave a link to that below um, for anyone who wants to have a look. Um, I noticed that um, you talk about transmuting emotions yes. and um, from your own experience that you're, you're going through now with your, your grief and loss. Yes. Um, and you talk about, um, yeah, so the, the time it takes to do that, the quiet it takes to do that, and obviously playing the didgeridoo and getting into that state, brainwave, brainwave state is helping you to transmute really uncomfortable emotions that a lot of us sort of don't really want to we all have a natural feeling to, to kind of not want to do that and not want to go there and not have to feel painful emotions yeah. don't we so could you yeah talk a little bit more about that yeah sure we uh, we're uh, most of us on this planet we are emotion phobic you know we've been brought up to to, uh, to, 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 you know, not be able to express our emotions. You know, if you were angry at school, you were, you know, you were, you were punished for it. You know, if you showed any sign of, of emotion, you know, it was considered to be, da you know, not a good thing. Um, and so this is how we have been brought up pretty much. You know, we don't like being around angry people. We don't like, we, we can't really tolerate other people who are having emotional states. So, you know, we've been brought up in this society that says it's not safe to express ourselves. And that really isn't helpful. And so for me, I, I, I really understood this uh, after, my, after my wife died. I, uh, we were living in the UK and so pretty much, you know, within a few weeks after she had died, I, I decided to pack the car and I rehomed the cats and I got rid of everything in the house and I drove to Spain, which is where I now live to start again. And I'd never experienced grief before this ever, you know, really, you know, my, my, my dad died. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I grieved for him. Uh, but for my wife passing away, it really, really, it really hit me. And I didn't really know what to, to expect. I just sort of thought, I'll just get on, you know, I'll just start a new life and down here in Spain, you know, I'll find another relationship, I'll find new friends, I'll start working and, and that'll be it. And that's, that was done. And what started to happen was, was the grief and the stress that I'd had from the previous year, because I, I cared for my wife for a year, she, she was terminally ill. The stress from all of that because I, I'd arrived here in Spain and suddenly I just sort of stopped. It all came up and it hit me really, really yeah. bad. And, and I just sort of thought, I'm just going to get on. I'm just going to get on. But the more I got on, the more it came up and, and it hit me. And I thought, well, I, I need to do something here. Otherwise, this is going to really, really, you know, just eat me, basically. Um, and so I've... Uh, I've been trained. I've been trained in neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis, and you know, I've been an energy healer for many years. So I sort of understood that 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 I needed to 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 go through a process of of, of, of understanding the grief, the loss, the emotion, and what it meant for me. Because uh, I'd, I'd helped other people in the past, but I never fully uh, could understand it. I, I suppose. Yeah. I've had to really go through it. So I, I recognized that I needed to stop all these distractions and I, uh, I needed to um, allow myself to feel uh, those emotions and feel them to the max. Yeah. Because I, I recognized that all of these emotions 
they're, they're not actually, they are, they are, we feel them, but they're actually energy and we feel them in the body. And when I started to sit with it, you know, for me, it was all, it was all in my, all in my stomach, you know, and I felt really ill. And, you know, I, I, I recognized that I needed to just feel this in my body and you know and the more I did that the more I could have just allow it to to move through me and recognize that, that it was almost like electricity you know it, it had a it, it, it had a heaviness to it it had a color um, you know it had a feeling a sensation um, it wasn't just the emotion uh, it, it, it's a feeling, so it, it, we have a feeling in our body. Yeah. It's a charge, and you know we we can see it in the brain. You know when we when it fires off, you know we know that it's there. It's an electricity that creates this feeling in our body, and, and so I recognised that I, I needed to allow this this feeling, this energy, this electricity to run its course yeah and i would sit out on the balcony and i and i would say right okay i'm going to feel this and i'd say right i'm going to put some parameters in place because at one point i didn't want to be here anymore i thought okay I, i'm going to keep myself safe that was the first thing yeah. um parameter number one um and that I would allow myself to fully feel it. And so I would sit out on the balcony some, some nights for hours and I would just sob until I couldn't, it was just gone, it was just done. And I, I did this whenever it hit me, you know, it would, it would happen in the strangest of circumstances, uh, going shopping. Um, you know, we used to shop together, and you know, if I went shopping, I'd often have a moment, and it's like, oh, and suddenly I, I just start crying, and it's like, well, I'm terribly sorry, everybody, but there's a man here sobbing his eyes out in the middle of the supermarket aisle. You're just going to have to get over it, <laughs> and just just allow it to to run its course. And um, to be honest, most people didn't really care. <laughs> They're all yeah. in their own way. It's just like, oh well, sorry, I just, I just, I may as well enjoy it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we're all so self-conscious, aren't we? We're so self-conscious, and we've been made to feel self-conscious about our emotions, haven't we? We've been kind of educated, like you said, uh, yeah. to kind of, uh, not express them. So what, what then happened is something very interesting that happened. The more that I did it. And this is what I didn't expect. I didn't see this coming at all. It was after like the following day afterwards or, you know, two days afterwards, something positive would happen. And I was like, that's really, really interesting. And I think right from an energetic point of view, why is that? Why is that? And I think, well, coming back to like attracts like, you know, when you release all this emotion, we come back to our natural state and our birth state is that we are born love. We are yeah. love. Yeah. We are joy. And our, that is our pure essence. Yeah. And this is who we really are. We, we are, we are born. We are, no, we are, um, controlled. Um, what's the word? Um, brainwashed if you like into all these other feelings of fear and control and all these sorts of things uh, that uh, it, it is not our natural state our natural state is is love peace joy yes you know, that is what we really are so when so i shifted all that something positive would come and it's because i think i'm i've shifted that frequency i've come back to my true nature and now i'm I'm resonating a different frequency and like attracts like we are magnets so whatever it is that you choose to think that 
motion creates a, a, an electromagnetic field in it your does. auric field. It does. It's the universe that this is the frequency that I am resonating at. And so like attracts like. And so positive things would happen. Yeah. And I would start to find, you know, a, a bit of a sense of humor and I'd start finding things funny again and, you know, but then I find that, you know, in, in any day I, I can be laughing one minute and then sobbing the next. So yeah. I found that all of my emotions have been heightened. And so now I don't label any of them as being good or bad. I just, yeah. I just accept them for what they are. And I just accept that, that they're fleeting. We are never happy all of the time. We are never sad all of the time it has to change but the yeah. problem is, is that we tell ourselves some sort of a story that we believe you know, we buy into this identity thing yeah that yeah. keeps it in place you know and i've had that oh I've, you know i lost my wife and da 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 da, da, da and, and poor me and, uh, you know, even I find myself difficult <laughs> in other people. We're all but, difficult. You know. Yeah. Um, so it's been definitely a, a waking up process for me. So this is what I enjoy helping people to realise, that, that emotions are not something to run away from. They're not to be frightened of. Even things like anger. Anger is better than revenge. You know, so yeah, if you're feeling absolutely. angry, it's certainly a lot better than you not wanting to go out and top somebody who you've been a victim of, of which I had. You know, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted revenge. And then that transmuted into anger. <clears throat> the anger transmuted eventually into understanding, which eventually turned into the point of, of seeing that person as being my biggest teacher of all. That's really interesting. I, I think that, um, and thank you so much for sharing sharing all of that, Greg. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think, I think, um, you know, I think the, the thing is with emotions is that they are kind of carriers of wisdom in and of themselves. And and when we're pushing our emotions down, um, or you know, not allowing those emotions to bring to the table what they want to bring, it's sort of you know, um, I think, uh, you know, working with people who suffer trauma, I noticed that um, what would happen, the trauma in and of itself was long gone from that person's life in many cases, but they were carrying the unresolved emotions. And with the emotions, there were kind of buried in the emotions were beliefs. Yes. So what happened is as they would allow themselves, as you said, to, to feel the emotion, not run away from it, but in a safe environment, to allow themselves to feel that emotion, those beliefs that, that they, they had inside in their subconscious mind that they were carrying, that were kind of wrapped up with the emotion, could also be released. So the negative beliefs that they had developed as a result of the trauma about not being good enough and not being, you know, um, being a bad person or whatever it was that had been, uh, they'd been made to feel or they'd, the sense they'd made of the trauma as a child, let's say, that wasn't true. All these, these uh, beliefs about themselves would come to their consciousness with the emotion and they could yes. challenge and change these beliefs and release them. And as you say, um, become connected with who they really are. Yes. Not this kind of whole negative, fearful, yes. not yes. good enough. Yes. System. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's difficult to do it on our own. Um, you know, I, I, I had some help uh, in doing what I do. Uh, I'm quite well connected with some really good therapists. So I found that that uh, I, I needed to find somebody that I could just talk. Yeah. I could just talk it out. Uh, and by talking it out, it allows you to then, you know, it's, part, it's part of just releasing it. 
So I, I think that it's really important that, that people can find themselves somebody who can just sit and listen and recognise that, that, that often these people um, don't need a huge amount of advice, uh, you just need someone to listen to and, and most of the time people have the answers within themselves and but it you know it takes a while for them to get to get to that point and and by opening but sorry by asking them open open type questions that would allow them to e explore the trauma uh, and and just to be able to speak that out is certainly very helpful uh, and I I had that uh, as well as you know playing my ditch and writing. Uh, they were my my outlets. I think it is difficult to do it on your own. Yeah. Uh, very. Yeah, yeah. I, I am now. You know, I, I had a I, I had about a month of counselling, um, and I found that really helpful. The counsellor actually said to me, she said, "Well, you're you're actually quite self aware, Greg." And I said, "Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I am." She says, I, "I don't know what else to do with you." I said, "Well." Really, I, I just want. I just need to talk. I just, yeah. I just want you to listen, and allow me that because uh, finding people out there, in in the real world, for uh, to 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 listen to you know me and, and and all this stuff is, is is quite few and far between. So sometimes we need that little bit of, that little bit of help. Yeah, it, it's it's easy to underestimate, isn't it, how powerful being heard is. Just mm, being heard. Yeah. And just saying something out loud as well for yourself. Yes. You can sort of hear yourself say, say it yeah. and kind of acknowledge it and work through it. Um, and certainly everybody needs that, don't they, at some point in their lives? Yes. Everybody right. needs that. Um, I, I did um, notice actually on Facebook that you mentioned um, at the series Afterlife with Ricky Gervais. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I am the encouragement of, of my son recently, ended up binge watching it myself. Um, and I just thought it was so cool because it's just so real. And um, I don't know, everybody's just, accepting each other's imperfections and, yes. and, and where they are in their journey and it's just such a beautiful exchange of completely kind of like um just everybody sharing and being accepted as yes. they are and where they are and him 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 realizing that actually being an angry you know being nasty to everyone wasn't really serving him in the long run mm. working through his rage in that particular way yes yeah. yeah, it was a beautiful series that I, I sobbed my way through the whole. I, I thought it was very, very cleverly written yeah. and directed by Ricky. I think he did a great job, and certainly there was a lot of that in there that I totally related to. The whole thing where he was, he was angry, he was self-centered, he was selfish. Uh, yeah, I was all. I was that, and that was. That for me was the the most ugliest part for me to to be able to to recognise. I really didn't like about myself the fact that that I, I knew that I was being self centred. I knew that it was kind of like, well, my grief is more than what your grief is, because, right? You know, you know, sort of a thing. And I and I wouldn't give anybody else really the chance to be heard because my grief was paramount. Right, yeah, you were suffering more than everyone else. I think yeah. it's sort of. I think we all we all go through that self centeredness, though, don't we? And and I think it's. I actually do think, in some senses, you know, as long as it's not prolonged for the rest of your life, you know, you you move through it like you did, and you are, you know, moving through your grief process. But I think um, it has a it has a, a place in a sense. It's sort of. Um, it's in a way a person saying to themselves, I deserve to be heard and I deserve to, I suppose you're looking at yourself and saying and recognizing that actually you have gone through something 
really painful and you know it is important and you do want to recognize that in yourself and it, it sort of seemed like um that initially in the series in afterlife he just wanted everyone else to recognize his own pain his pain and he was sort of trying to get everyone to recognize his pain and then afterwards he starts to re really recognize it himself in a different way um and it, it, it is that turning inwards isn't it, it that's, is. that, yeah. that's the way out yeah and you could see him he, could, he was starting to change and you could see him he was becoming you, you touched on this more accepting of other people more able to listen to other people and and yeah that there was there was a time in there that he was just starting to switch it was a bit of a glimmer and and I felt that with me it was kind of like oh I just feel as though you know uh, yeah a little bit of joy a little bit of you know I'm able to sit with somebody else now and and listen to them and give them a shot so another thing I was going to ask you about Greg is your energy healing mm -hmm. so you you I noticed on your on your website that you said that you've always been sensitive yeah. to energy so I know that, um, I mean, again, we talked about um, the material world and how in the West we're very focused on, what, on the material world. And, uh, but yet this invisible world exists, this world of energy. And a lot of the scientists like, uh, um, well, Einstein recognized it, um, you know, um, and, and all the scientists would refer to it, but so you this is something that, but we have a lot of skepticism around it we have skepticism around it don't we now in the west so but you were you were aware of this when you were just a child so could you yeah. talk a little bit about about that and how that kind of manifested in your life well it manifested in the way that i i've i've always had imaginary friends <laughs> i suppose they'd be labeled as um, but to me, they were very real, and um, I, I remember them as far back as my childhood. And I would play with them out in the playground, and um, I'd zap them with my with my fingers. And I had like bolts of lightning would come out from my fingers. So, so we'd play this 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 game uh, out in the playground. Uh, and so I was very much aware that, that it was kind of like a magical power, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. And I don't, I don't know whether I picked it up from somewhere, possibly, I don't know. But to me, it was very real. And I've always sensed them, them around me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've picked up on, uh, I'm very sensitive with picking up on energy with, with people. Um, you know, I, I can be, it's sort of strange, I, I'll be, I'll be talking to somebody, and it's usually in, in, you know, in person, direct, and then suddenly I'll, I'll I don't know what it is, it'll be a word they say or a way that they look, and then suddenly I'm seeing whole concepts as to what's going on or, or what their trauma is. Right, okay. With, with my wife, I, I could see that, you know, her, her illnesses were created for over a very, very long period of time. Um, however, there wasn't really a lot that I could do about it. Uh, or, uh, over, over the years, I, I attempted her to, 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 to open up to me about it, but, you know, she... She couldn't for some... for, for you know, her, her, own, her, her own reasons. Um, and um, so yeah, I sort of have this. It's a strange thing where suddenly I'll just have ha, have a knowing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like intuition. It sounds yes. like you're highly intuitive. Highly intuitive, highly sensitive. Uh, it, it it has created problems for me in my life in that I could never walk into a. I could never walk into a pub without first of all looking to where all the exits are and uh, I'd, I'd often have to get up and go off to visit visit the loo just to escape 
the energy because it was all a bit too intense because it I felt as though I was under attack <laughs> by everybody else's stuff because I would just pick up on everything yeah yeah I mean that's um that's something I can relate to um yeah. and it's um it's actually it's been studied hasn't it by Dr Elaine Aron as high sensitivity and yes. apparently it even exists with fruit fruit flies it, it exists in the animal kingdom high sensitivity that's interesting yeah that's... with a small percentage of each um species even like i say down to fruit flies so it's not some kind of like i know some people think it's just a bit weird and you know not yeah. really it's sort of made up it's actually not it's it's been scientifically yeah. studied by anthropologists yeah wow yeah yeah yes it's true yeah yeah well, i've become i've become less what's the word i've become more able to sit in those places now uh, I've been more able to kind of almost transmute that that which used to bother me you know I'd, 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 I'd be uncomfortable and wanting to leave now I can be aware of, of how I'm feeling uh, and just sort of sit with it and not get caught up with the stress of it because it used yeah. to me out it's interesting what you said about unless you're a Buddha. You said earlier on in the in the interview, well, you know, unless you're a Buddha who can kind of go in anywhere. And I think with that whole thing about being a Buddha, it's almost about it's about owning and being taking responsibility and knowing how to change your own emotional state and your own energetic state, sort of like bringing the dial down. At will, yeah, being able to do it at will. Yes, yeah. And this it takes a lot of time and practice. Yes, and focus. We need to be able to be, be able to observe yourself. So it's almost kind of like you need to be able to take yourself beyond you to be able to be self-aware, to be able to see well, what does this person, Greg, look like? How is he responding in this situation? And by taking yourself out, you can often you can often get real good insights and you think oh god i'm acting like a complete spud here you know <laughs> <laughs> is this how i want to respond no it's not okay how do i choose to respond well it's not this what might it be then so you know i, I think that it's so it's such a useful tool in 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 our awakening that we become more self-aware Mm. Absolutely. So you were really, you were born a healer in a sense, was certainly born with that extra sense, sensory, I guess, ability. Yeah. But I never liked it. No. I never accepted myself for it, you know. I, I really disliked myself. And it was only through meeting the didgeridoo that um, I felt safe with it because it was kind of like something between me and the person. Right, you know, okay. Kind of like, um, I'm not fully having to talk. Uh, it's non-talk based. Uh, yeah. I can sort of do it by a little bit of distance. So uh, the, the didgeridoo has, has actually taught me uh, confidence because I could never do public speaking. I, I, you know, I detested public speaking, but the more I got into this, I got more and more requests for public speaking. I'd be horrified. But then, then I recognised, well, this is what I do now, and I and I need to learn to be comfortable with it. And now I love, I love being on stage. <laughs> I'm now. Right. Sure. It never used to be like this. I I was very very shy, very introverted, very quiet. Um, and now, uh, you know, I, I love, I love public speaking. Um, it's still, if I'm at a party, you know, I, I will often be quiet, but if you put me up on stage, you know, in front of an audience where I'm talking about what I love to do, yeah, uh, suddenly I just step into gear and, and it just comes off naturally. There's no planning. It just happens. Yeah. You just lose yourself calm consciousness i suppose i think passion does that doesn't it for you Absolutely, yes. mm. 
Okay, Greg, thanks so much for speaking to us and sharing your, your experiences with us. It's, it's really kind of you and generous of you to have done that. And um, Greg has also offered to do um, a didgeridoo sound healing on the channel. Um, so I'm going to be putting that, that up next week. So thank you very much for that, Greg. And if anyone wants to have a look at Greg's website, it's www.gregchapman.com. Um, that's right, isn't it, Greg? Yeah. It's, uh, Greg is spelt uh, G-R-E-G-G. Chapman, C H A P M A N, Greg Chapman.com. Two G's on the end of Greg. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that, Greg. And, and thanks again for speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you.